Hi everyone and good morning. I'm Mike Holfeld. You know, recently I've done a lot of reporting on how our veterans are cared for once they come home. You know how I feel about this. It's important to me. Listen, the good news, Central Florida ranks among the best locations in the nation in helping homeless vets. In fact, Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer set a goal of getting every veteran off the streets and into a home by the end of this year. And I'm told we're very close to that goal with 25 days to go. On top of that, we are home to a brand new state-of-the-art VA hospital. I've got to tell you, it's terrific. But there are areas of concern nationwide. There's still controversy over how long our vets must wait for access to health care. I get calls all the time. And we're going to talk about that and much more with uh, our guest, Dr. Lisa Zucker, who this week was named the new chief of staff for the Orlando VA Medical Center. Uh, you know, there are more than 400,000 vets living in Central Florida. In her new role, Dr. Zucker will oversee the care of more than 105,000 of them. Welcome to Flashpoint. Well, thank you. So I was going to open up with what's your biggest <coughs> challenge, but you have a personal challenge right now. Why don't you share that with us? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, well, I guess professionally, the, the chief of staff job is a big challenge. But um, your personal health. My personal health. Um, so yeah, uh, back in May, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I actually had my mammogram done at the Orlando VA and my initial biopsies. Um, uh, fortunately, I'm a stage one breast cancer. I just finished chemotherapy about a month ago. Oh, I'm finishing up radiation. And I think I'm a good example of how, um, uh, how veterans are taken care of, especially with the Orlando VA. There were some services I could not get at the, at the, the VA, so I actually used Orlando Health. Um, that's where I'm going for radiation and a wonderful group of doctors there. I think we're blessed to have the Orlando community, um, uh, just, just state-of-the-art medical facilities, that when we don't have capacity in the VA that we're able to utilize. What's your prognosis, do you think? Oh, it's very good. Is it? It's very good. Um, otherwise, I guess I wouldn't have taken this job. I think some people get down, you know, diagnosed with cancer and they wind down. I guess I looked at this as a, an opportunity and a challenge. And, and uh, I, I think two weeks from now, when I've at least finished my cancer treatment mission, that, uh, that, that maybe I only have one, uh, one main focus at that point. You know, as a physician, you have a unique insight. What was your impression of how they treated you there? And what's the kind of cooperation we have with the hospitals in the area? Yeah. Um, good? Yeah, it's very good. And, and you know, I look at yeah, my role as a physician and now my role as a patient, I think it'll make me a better leader, uh, a better doctor, certainly having to be on the other side of the stethoscope. But very good coordination with uh, the Orlando Health Partners. And, uh, and then uh, just the other day, I had my um, chemotherapy port taken out at the Lake Baldwin VA. Oh, good, good, so, good. So, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm a, a leader, but I'm also a patient. And you see it. And a veteran. And yes. a veteran. Yes. Well, thank you for your service. We appreciate that. You know, you're humble, so I'm going to brag for you. There were 25 yeah. people up for this job, right? Correct. An, and you applied. Yes. Even having the diagnosis, you said, I don't care, I'm going to go forward with it. Correct. What, what drove you there? What was the inspiration? Uh, you know, I've been chief of medicine for two years. I was chief of medicine my last tour of duty for eight years at Brook Army Medical Center. So oh. I've done the chief of medicine, and I think you're always looking at the next opportunity, the next uh, chance to maybe do a little bit more. Uh, I really um, appreciate the mentorship of the former chief of staff, uh, Ken Goldberg. Um, that's, he was the one that got me here. Uh, I thought that if I applied, I'd at least set the bar <laughs> at my level. <laughs> and if there was someone else that was a better candidate, I would be happy being continuing to be chief of medicine. You from town? You're a local girl, or are you from South Dakota? South Dakota. So, and no intention of going back. Don't miss that weather, huh? No, my <laughs> when I left the military, I was looking for warm places, and fortunately, this was the first place I interviewed. I saw all the potential of Medical City, the new VA, um, the opportunity to be involved at the ground floor. Sometimes I feel we're in the basement, <laughs> working sure, our way to the sure. ground floor, at least those first couple of years. Yeah. But um, it's a, an exciting time and a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to, to build your own staff and, and open a new facility. And, and looking at that, just that blueprint, this is a big, big challenge, isn't it? A lot of work. Correct. Um, the VA, to my understanding, has not opened a new facility since 1995. So we're groundbreaking. It's, it's not like opening a new hospital next to an old hospital, right. moving staff over. Um, totally new um, missions for us. The inpatient mission, ICU, um, different types of surgeries that we could not perform at Lake Baldwin without having that inpatient backup. Radiation oncology, so actually new areas of medicine that we had to send all of our veterans out for in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and then services that we've had, now we can actually take care of more complex patients. Um, our new facility will have a cath lab, cardiac cath lab, electrophysiology lab, 
a PET scanner, two wow. MRIs, so a CAT scan. So we have all scan. this coming in, in, in the future, or it's there it's, already? It's there already. Because you in opened in May, right? Correct. So is it open for business, if you will? Um, I, I want to say outpatient okay. is, is nearly completely open. Um, okay. The only thing we need to move over from Lake Baldwin is our GI procedures and ambulatory surgery. Um, so most of our outpatient is there. Um, our MRIs are up and working, our CAT scans. So, so we have some of those things I mentioned that are already being utilized to take care of veterans. We're targeting opening up our, in, uh, our inpatient facility the early part of 2016. Um, and that'll be inpatient wards and some ICU capabilities. Uh, initially, it's just getting things open, yeah. then building up capacity, and then adding complexity of care. Now let me circle back. What, what's the biggest uh, challenge do you think you have? I mean, you've, had a, you've only yeah. been at the job, what, a few days? Right. What do you think it is? Wow. Um, I think just getting the inpatient facility opened as fast as we can, sure. but as safe as we can. And in part because we do have a community standard that we need to live up to, and, and we live in a pretty robust uh, community that has you know, some really good medical facilities. So part of the challenge has been um, balancing how fast we can open with how safely we can open, meaning getting our personnel sure. here, trained, on board, um, and, and just a lot of infrastructure um, issues as well. You know, communication. You know, um, the, the buildings. You know, the buildings complete. It's now the fi finishing touches. Now you ha you've got the car. Now you have to have yeah, someone to drive it, right? Exactly. And make sure you can do it. What are the most common problems soldiers coming home are facing? I mean, we've had a, yeah. a lot of men and women serving our country coming back, and, and there's um, a, a full gamut of problems. As you know, I get calls all the time from spouses saying we need help. Yeah. We're waiting in line. What, what are the mo most common? Yeah, well, I, I think common things being common, it's, it's just the common illnesses that everyone deals with. But war-related, it's kind of, you know, the, the, both of both si the best of both sides is that um, we, we had the, the highest survivability rate of any war. 90% um, of soldiers that were injured survived, uh, but they survived often with devastating injuries. You know, so, you know, the amputee care. Um, the, the burn patients. I, I worked out of San Antonio where we had the burn unit. Right. But I, I think the other issue that probably affects more is the invisible wounds of war, the, the post-traumatic stress, That's what I was the wondering, traumatic yeah. brain injury. Uh, so the VA and the Orlando VA has invested a lot of resources in mental health. You were in Iraq, right? Correct, twice. What perspective does, does that uh, give you, what, what these um, people are going through? I mean, you saw it firsthand. Correct. Um, and, and my first tour, I was actually a frontline practicing physician. I was the only intensive care unit physician at uh, the, the downtown Baghdad Combat Support Hospital, the one that you see the Baghdad ER. Oh, yeah. So I was there. So um, that kind of like MASH from the old TV series or something uh, entirely different? Probably different. I yeah. mean, we really practiced state-of-the-art care. Um, you know, we were challenged. We had to be very flexible. Um, I was very proud of when we'd have a mass casualty that we treated everyone the same. We took the most injured patient. Uh, to, to the OR first, whether it was an insurgent, whether it was one of our own. Um, just our evacuation c capabilities um, were, were incredible. Uh, we hardly had a soldier stay overnight. We did um, damage control surgery, kind of just stopping the bleeding, sent them to our, our main evac hospital in Iraq was Balad, so they could get on a fixed wing and be in launch stool, often within 24 hours, and often back to the States within 48 to 72 hours. So our facility in Baghdad um, mostly had Iraqi patients in it because we did such a good job of stabilizing our service members and getting them back to um, definitive care in the United States. I don't want to be too intrusive, but I'm just looking at you and I'm admiring you, your drive, <laughs> and I'm wondering, how did that change your life? I mean, you yeah. lived it. I see it from news yeah. footage. Um, I, I say it's kind of the best, um, best part of my military military career and kind of the worst, yeah. um, some of the things that you've seen, but it really gave me a flavor for what um, some of the other Army s soldiers go through. You know, I, I, I left, I, I went to war um, as a doctor who served in the Army. I left as an Army doctor, where I really felt part of the mission and unit. There are no days off. You know, we rounded on patients at 8 in the morning and 8 at night. There was no holidays. There was no weekends. But you were a strong, cohesive unit, and you had to make things work. And you really became a tight family. And I think that's one of the I I issues. You had a very organized structure, 
And I think it's one of the challenges that our service members face when they come back is the chaos yeah. of modern society. You know, Acclimating to it again. Yes, exactly. You made friends along the way, close friends? Oh, very you close. You mentioned like a family. Yeah, you talk about your battle buddies, and they're always your battle buddies because they, they have your back, and you know, it's, it's, it's a hard mission, and you really rely on each other. Working there, working here in the U.S., night uh, and day, isn't it? Very night and day. So some, some of the good things I think about Iraq, too, is, again, we, we made things work. We had kind of less rules, less regulation, less documentation. Um, and those are the things that maybe slow you down a little bit in the United right. States, but are necessary evils. No signing forms. Let me see your insurance exactly. card, right? You, exactly. You are in there. Exactly, yes. Yeah. You're so moving quickly. You, you just practice medicine to, at its purest form. What inspired you to do that? I mean... Yeah. Well, um, I want to say I, I always wanted to be a military doctor, but that wouldn't be truth, uh, truthful. Um, I, I wanted to be a physician. Uh -huh. um, when I got to the University of South Dakota, which isn't a real expensive medical school, but it was, still was beyond my means, I took a military scholarship with full intention of paying my time back, getting out. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really enjoyed it, and I had some nice assignments. Um, I, I uh, ended up in Hawaii, my first tour of duty after completing my six years of post-medical school training. No kidding, that must have been yeah. fantastic. Huh? It was, it was, it was, uh, I had, a, you know, and again, I think I'm incredibly fortunate, the doctors I worked with, the size of the hospital, the fact that we had trainees there, other residents that I could teach, and I was young and energetic, and I signed up for every team that I could belong to, fast response teams, to Johnson Atoll, Christmas Island, wow. the Maldives. I did um, two missions to Laos, um, looking for MIA remains from the Vietnam War, and that was a particularly rewarding experience, you know, putting yourself in the footsteps of some of the Vietnam veterans, knowing what elephant grass is, that it really yeah. is, you know, six foot high, and the sites that we went and um, excavated were overgrown, you know, so we actually went in there with machetes and the locals and had to, you know, cut everything down, grid it out, sift. Literally a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Yeah. I'm just curious, do you have a, a hero, a personal hero, someone that you'll never forget? Wow. Um, talk personal heroes. I, first thing that always comes to my mind is my father. Um, he's a, a coach, now a Hall of Fame coach in South Dakota, so really? small time, town, um, high school, football, basketball, coaching, but I think I learned a lot from him. How to motivate, how to, how to build your bench, how to get the most out of individuals. You know, and, and, and again, being part of a team. I'm sure the, your parents were proud. Yes. Brothers, it, brothers and sisters, too? Yes. Um, so I have a brother, an older brother, who went into family practice, although both my par pa parents were teachers, so oh. no medical, no military, really, in our family, right. other than a, an, an, a, an uncle who had a very distinguished career. Um, and then a sister who's a pharmacist and a brother that's a musician in Chicago. So Wow. Yes. What a, what a wonderful family background. Listen, I'm really enjoying this. I hope you are too. Hope you are at home. Listen, when we come back, how do we make sure our veterans and their families know about all the care available to them and that no one falls through the bureaucratic cracks? You know what I'm talking about. I'm Mike Holfeld. This is Flashpoint on News 6. Back in a couple minutes. Welcome back to Flashpoint. I'm Mike Holfeld here with Dr. Lisa Zocker. I'm enjoying this. She's the new <laughs> chief of staff for the Orlando VA Medical Center. You know, you're, you're one of the best secrets in town. And I got a couple of tough questions for you now. Okay. Uh, the times, the wait time scandal. I get so many calls on this. Now, listen, this is not to be confused with what wait times in an emergency room, but wait times for access to care. The scandal, as you recall, uh, rocked the Obama administration 15 months ago when at least 40 veterans in Phoenix died waiting for care. They were denied appointments or experienced many delays in getting appointments, and a resulting investigation showed that same kind of mismanagement was happening all across the country. Since then, the VA secretary has resigned and Congress passed new laws they hope ensure better care. So, I have to mm -hmm. ask you the tough question in the first one. Was it ever to the point where local vets were dying? Our, our, our guys, our men and women here, were they dying because of this? I don't believe so. Okay. You know, it's, 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 it's hard to know um, for sure, but I think we've been very transparent as an organization uh, with, our, with, our, with our waiting times, with our wait lists. Um, we try to triage our patients, get them in on a priority basis. The, uh, uh, um, so I, I, 
Okay. I, I'm just going back to my, yeah. my chief of staff and the directive he gave right. us was, you know, be truthful, be honest. You know, if we have access issues, bring it to his attention. Now bring it to my attention. Yeah, you've and inherited we, it. And we have done, uh, over the last two years, I mean, we have hired um, many, many, many more physicians, in part for activation of inpatient, but also to address some of our own access issues in primary care. Um, dermatology is one of those areas that is incredibly hard. It's competitive, I think, even in you know in the non-VA to, to hire enough dermatologists. Really? Why? Um, Just well, tough to find talent. Uh, yes, and, and I think for a federal agency trying to match some of the salaries oh, that sure, are out there. Sure. You know, I, I recall economists saying too many people and not enough resources. I yes. And that just keeps going in my head as I'm talking to you this yeah. morning. Are there too many vets and not enough doctors available and that's part of the problem? Is that the equation right. we're dealing with? No, and I think demand is always going to be there, especially in certain areas. We were a little bit different than other VAs and that's why I think we didn't get caught up as much in that we already had to rely on our non-VA um, medical partners. I see because we didn't have an inpatient facility. So we had actually built up a very robust non-VA care system with care case managers. Now we have choice. There's a lot of money that has been invested by Congress into what's called choice. And again, it's, it's the veteran's choice. If they have to, if they can't get an appointment within 30 days, that we will help them find a physician or, or whatever care they need in the community. So give me a window of time. How long, what's the wait time here? to get a vet from walking in yeah. to getting the care. Is it 30 days or longer? It depends on the specialty. Some specialties we have same day access. Uh, okay, well, cardiology that's good. is a good example of, of where we get all our veterans in at this point in time. Dermatology is, is on the other end where, where um, we, we end up sending a lot of our veterans out to um, non-VA dermatologists. It's going to get better though, isn't it? It's going to get better, yes. Yeah. Uh, actively recruiting um, and, and, and there's just some things that we could not do, even though we had skilled physicians, um, but we just didn't have that capability in an outpatient facility. I want to share this story I did uh, before you and I met just a few months ago, but I think it's going to hit home for you. Uh, a story I put back together in May. It's the story of a local Marine with kidney cancer. Hmm. He's an ex-Marine on the brink. And they don't think I'll survive another brain tumor. Donald Burpee is convinced the very country he served contaminated the drinking water at a place called Camp Lejeune. He was stationed there for four months in 1975. I openly admit when I joined the Marine Corps that I could be killed in combat in a war. But I sure didn't expect my government to poison me. He's talking about carcinogens. Scientists found several solvents in the wells there, including levels of TCE 280 times the EPA standard. Now 59, the ex-Marine's body is riddled with cancer that started in his kidneys and never stopped. I don't want any Marine anywhere to ever have to go through this. There are thousands of others that say the same. Mike Partain is one of 86 men diagnosed with breast cancer. He was born on the base. The geneticist at Shands University Hospital said that my chances are in the general population of developing breast cancer was 0.05%. It's kind of like what contest in hell did I win to get this? While medical bills are covered by the VA, thousands are being denied life insurance and disability benefits that cover the basic cost of living. How can you set down a criteria and say this is what makes you eligible and then when you try to get your benefits, all they do is deny you and deny you and deny you. 25 denials in all. Why? The VA says there's limited connection between the chemicals he was exposed to and his cancer. But the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry tells Local 6 in black and white, it's possible for the drinking water exposures at Camp Lejeune to cause kidney cancer. And the Institute of Medicine recommends veterans should get the benefit of the doubt. Burpee is still waiting. It's not for me, it's, it's for my family, it's for my wife. But it's also for every veteran that is going through the exact same thing that I am. In April, the VA reported 9,600 veterans filed for Camp Lejeune related benefits. Only 778 were approved. 71 had kidney cancer, just like Don Burpee. There's gonna be a lot of veterans they're contaminated from Camp Lejeune 
and their cancers and stuff die and die needlessly. You know, I love that guy. Uh, Don Burpee died in July, less than two months after that story aired. Before his death, though, we worked for him on this. We were able to get him a final hearing to review the facts in the case. He wanted his family to be taken care of, and unfortunately, the family is still waiting, but I continue to work on that. Mm -hmm. Doctor, first, as a vet, yeah. your reaction to that story. Not as the doctor, right. not as, as your job, but as a vet who's been there, who, who, who's yeah. done that. You know these people. No, I mean, I, I, I feel for um, th this veteran. Um, just like I feel for all the veterans. Uh, I mean, veterans are special because they are people that raised their hand and said that they would take a bullet, you know, to pr protect their country. And yeah. so I, I, you know, for an individual, um, you, know, you know, like this veteran, I, 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 I feel for him and his family. Now, when he comes to you, so everyone and, and the vets that have called me understand, you have nothing to do with the benefits. But if someone like mm -hmm. Don Burpee comes to you, you're there to help them, right? Correct. I mean, first and foremost, I tell all my physicians, you are the veteran's advocate. You need to lean forward um, you, and, and do whatever you can for that veteran. And it's, it's, sometimes it's simple things, sometimes it's more complex things, but simple things like taking a good history, physical, diagnosing, treatment, that's what our arm really takes care of, the, the VHA side. And that's why you're there, to help. Correct. All and right, we're going to take a break. Yeah. Thank you okay. so much. Uh, back with our final moments with Dr. Lisa Zocker, the new Chief of Staff at the Orlando VA Medical Center. After the break, I'm Mike Holfeld. You're watching Flashpoint right here on News 6. We have 40 seconds. I'm going to give you the floor, Doctor. Uh, your thoughts for the people at home, your biggest yeah. challenge or your number one priority, whatever you'd like to share with us. Yeah, I, this incredible opportunity of being Chief of Staff of the Orlando VA. Um, the, the reason I came here was just this opportunity to recruit high quality physicians and, and boy that the staff that we've assembled um, the, the veterans have a lot waiting for them um, we have some very special providers just the partnership that we have with with medical city our lake nona partners so uh... the moors the, the university of central florida college of medicine the chance to, to work with residents trainees so so all of those things and and but most importantly um, the opportunity to work with our incredible staff um, this incredible community in Orlando. And You've sold me. I'm gonna, I have yes. to break it there. Well done. <laughs> I think they made the right choice with you. Thanks for being with us. Well, thank you. That's Flashpoint for this Sunday. I'm Mike Holfeld. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again real soon.